And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jake Dalton, who is the something like distinguished Kensei Professor of uh, Tibetan Buddhist uh, Studies at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, I've known him for, for we would say, donkey's years, yeah. So, yeah, thank you, Nathan, for inviting me and the uh, Center for Asian Studies, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Buddhism, like many religious traditions, has a kind of exoteric and an esoteric tradition. So tantric Buddhism is more the esoteric tradition, um, sort of a mystical tradition of uh, symbols and equivalences, and um, and it's all secret and only supposed to be practiced by initiates and so on. No one really uh, in the West, no one took this tradition very seriously, just sort of dismissed it as demonolatry, but. Finally, over the past two decades, uh, it's starting to get its due as a, as a topic of study. Somewhat surprisingly, scholars have been exploring the relationship between Tantric Buddhism and the state in particular. So in 2002, Ronald Davidson uh, wrote that, that kingship is, quote, the central and defining metaphor for mature esoteric Buddhism are maps of the ideal imperial realm with kingly Buddhas sitting on their thrones at the centers of the, their palaces, surrounded by their queens, ministers, uh, messengers, and vassals. Um, and then secret initiations are coronation rites. Uh, vajras, the objects they hold, uh, like this right here. Um, and then still others have weighed in on related questions such as the relationship between the antinomian rhetoric and shocking imagery of the tantras and institutional concerns. So Christian Vedemeyer, for example, writing in 2012, has insisted that despite this kind of outrageous language, tantric Buddhism emerged from, quote, the cultural milieu of the conservative monastic institutions. So whatever their differences, all three of these authors uh, seem to agree. Early Tantric Buddhism and the political interests of the ruling class worked hand in glove. When we turn to the case of the Tibetan Empire, however, the situation is a little bit more complex. In some ways, early Tibetan Buddhists made use of Tantric Buddhism just as one might expect, fashioning their emperors as divine kings, exercising their dominion at the center of a mandala with awakened compassion, uh, and, uh, and yet there were limits to this. Pouring this question is the so-called lexicon in two parts, the Dradra Bampo Nipa. Um, this was, here's a copy uh, from the, today's canon. This was an imperially sponsored guide for early Tibetan translators working uh, in the late 8th and 9th century, early 9th centuries, uh, created to control and regularize their translation work. So the lexicon is divided into two parts, as its title suggests, maybe, uh, explaining the principles behind Buddhist translation and the coining of new Tibetan terms when you need to do so to translate a Sanskrit word. And the second part being a discussion of difficult series, uh, a series of difficult Sanskrit terms and their uh, official Tibetan equivalents. So right now, we have five witnesses that we know of, of this lexicon in two parts. Apart from the one preserved in the Tibetan canon, the Tengyuri, we have uh, two incomplete um, uh, copies, the first two pages here, uh, and then one short extract just at the bottom of this one, um, all from Dunhuang, this cave uh, that was discovered a little over a hundred years ago on the Silk Road out in central and northwest China. Um, uh, the first one, 845, is uh, sort of quite long, although still incomplete. Um, and then we have uh, only two folios that were uh, discovered at, uh, in the early 1990s at Tapo Monastery in Spiti in northwest India. So many hundreds, maybe even a thousand miles from Dunhuang. Uh, and uh, these two folios probably date from the 11th century or maybe considerably earlier. So as uh, Christina Shara-Schaub has observed, the ge geographic spread of these witnesses from western Tibet, northwest India, all the way to the northeastern reaches of Dunhuang 
may well reflect the court's practice of sending copies, beginning with 13 copies. 13 is sort of the number of completeness in early Tibet. Um, sending copies of such imperial proclamations to be stored at specific sites across Tibet and its conquered territories. So this lexicon may have been sent out to be stored at various places. Um, uh, okay, so the can canonical and Dunhuang witnesses uh, that um, I first showed, these three and the canonical one, are all more or less the same, reflecting a version of the lexicon that was promulgated in, uh, it seems, 814 of the Common Era, so the early 9th century, during the reign of the Emperor Tri De Songtsen, uh, aka Senalek. However, as the Tibetan scholar uh, Jampa Panglung observed in his invaluable 1994 article about this Tabo manuscript, this witness uh, represents an earlier version of the lexicon, one that announces its date as being a pig year when the emperor Tri Song Detsen, that's a little confusing, there's Tri Song Detsen and Tri De Song Sen, but anyway, this is the slightly earlier, um, uh, was staying in residence at Sungkar. So this pig year must correspond to either 783 or 797, or 795, um, uh, because that's when Tri Song Detsen was uh, ruling, uh, and uh, most likely 783, I think. Um, because Tri Song Detsen, who ended his reign in 797, spent his last days at Tsungkar Palace, where this was supposed to have been written, um, Pang Lung, the, the scholar who first found this manuscript, decided in favor of 795, thinking, oh, it must have been written just before Tri Song Detsen died. But really, I see no reason to assume the emperor didn't stay at the same place earlier, too. And indeed, as Shara Shab has noted, this Tabo lexicon um, references the involvement of two prime ministers, Lunchempo, uh, Gyelsik and Takra, um, Takra, both of whom were dismissed from their posts as prime ministers around 783. So this would make the 795 date less likely leaving 783 as our best bet. So, all this is relevant to our question of the t imperial court's uh, treatment of the tantras because the lexicon famously includes an order to the early Tibetan translators of these esoteric texts. In the earlier lexicon, this one from 783, fortunately it has this one passage, um, uh, it reads as follows. As for the tantras of mantra, uh, throughout these, mantra is kind of the word for tantric Buddhism. As for the tantras, the texts of mantra, even the scriptures themselves say they should be kept secret. They are never allowed to be taught and explained to someone who is unfit, as it would be harmful were their enigmatic words wrongly understood. Therefore, Permission to study them must be requested, and once permission has been granted, the translation of mantra must be done by excellent scholars who do not mistake its meaning and do not mistake the scriptures in scripture, strict accordance with how mantra has been imparted in the past. Unfortunately, the very last line is damaged, but we get the idea. The court under Chi Song Detsen in 783, in the second half of the eighth century, um, during the beginnings of all this great translation project, uh, they did strictly limit the circulation and teaching of the tantras somewhat and, but, and insisted that they be translated only with imperial consent and under the supervision of recognized, conservatively trained scholars. But when we turn to the later lexicon of 814, the version uh, preserved in the canon today and in the Dunhuang manuscripts, we see some significant changes have been made. So here we go. As for the tantras of secret mantra, the scriptures themselves say they should be kept secret. So far as the same. They are never allowed to be taught and explained to those who are unfit. Until now, until this moment, up to this point, they have been translated and practiced, but the explanations of their enigmatic words have been misunderstood. And they have been taken literally and wrongly practiced. While it is noted that some of the tantras of mantra have already been collected and translated into Tibetan, Henceforth, regarding the Dharani mantras and higher teachings, all the different classes of tantra, 
Uh, unless permission for translation has been granted, the tantras of mantra and the words of mantra are not to be collected or translated. So here, the first couple sentences remain more or less the same, but then the proclamation reveals that misuse of the tantras is no longer just some theoretical concern. It has been happening. Tibetans, we are told, have been taking the tantras literally. So when it says, have sex with your mother and kill your father, they may have done so. Uh, so goes the claim. Uh, and practiced them wrongly. Uh, with these crimes in mind, the proclamation agrees that the translation of a tantra may still be theoretically allowable with imperial permission, but this new version no longer makes any mention of approaching the court with requests for such permission. It's almost, and it's almost with a kind of air of regret that the proclamation allows for the fact that some tantras have already been collected and translated, but now it prohibits not only the free translation of tantras, but even the mere owning or collecting of them. In the 31 years separating 783 when the earlier lexicon was issued and 814 when the later one was, the court's concerns about the dangers of the tantras grew considerably stronger. Uh, a manuscript from Dunhuang, long sheet. Uh, not surprisingly, the figures involved in composing the updated lexicon with the even stricter rules um, are different. The figures involved in composing it are different than those mentioned in the earlier one from 783. As already mentioned, its publication, this, the later one, was overseen uh, not by Tri Song Detsen, but by Tri De Song Sen. Uh, the colophon adds that the project was enacted by a series of Indian, and, uh, Indian scholars and Tibetans, the Tibetans headed by Ratna Rakshita and Dharma, Dharma Tashila, Rinchen So and Shini Chutsuchen. Both the latter figures, these Tibetans involved in the strict uh, lexicon, uh, both of them are known from various early translations, so they were translators themselves, and from the Kalafan to the Mahavyutpati, this famous um, Sanskrit to Tibetan dictionary that was produced around the same time to help translators, uh, and uh, probably produced not long before the 814 lexicon. Uh, the, the monk scholar Dharma Tashila, uh, in particular, was, was therefore central to this whole imperial translation project. His name clearly attached to the restrictions on owning, translating, and teaching any tantric texts, this Dharma Tashila. So this is a little surprising because of the existence of this short text from Dun Huang. I will tip J380, which is in the British Library today contains a Tibetan rendition of a prophecy from one of the closing chapters of the influential Tantra, the Manjushri and Mulakalpa. Um, the Dunhuang manuscript ends with a brief colophon, which I extracted here, <coughs> which reads, these few verses, this prophecy, from the Manjushri Tantra were translated in the bird year at the Tsungkar Palace by the revision translator, the monk Dharmatashila. Now, the received Tibetan translation of the Manjushri Amulakalpa Tantra dates from much later, the mid 11th century, when it was translated by the Indian teacher Kumara Kalasha and the Tibetan uh, monk Shakyalodro. No earlier translation appears in either of the extant imperial period catalogs, the Denkarma and the Pangtangma. Nonetheless, this Iowell Tip J380 suggests that at least one Sanskrit copy of the Manjushri Mulakalpa had made its way to Tibet by the early 9th century. And while the, early, by the, while the entire Tantra may not have been translated at that time, portions were extracted according to early Tibetan Buddhist interests, as we see here. In fact, there's one other piece of evidence, just to go down a rabbit hole for a moment, um, that this was the case. <coughs> uh, these this is actually one, originally one manuscript, but it was split up and now is shelved according to three shelf marks in London and Paris. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the original manuscript uh, contained a collection, probably a large one, of, of contemplative and ritual works informed by Chittamatra, mind only, and uh, Madhyamaka doctrine and Kriya and Yoga Tantra ritual, the sort of lower classes of tantric of practice. In terms of dating, 
this will maybe become relevant later on, but I'll just mention it here. Uh, probably the most significant aspect of its paleography is, this is my little, I keep going on about this. Uh, it has these midline dots. I wonder if you can zoom in. Normally, Tibetan has dots in line with the head, so at the top of the, each character. But here you see them floating downward. Here's a double sec. They're sort of floating downward. Uh, that's a little bit unusual. Um, and uh, I think they're seen much more often in ninth uh, century manuscripts from Dunhuang than 10th. Basically, the Tibetan manuscripts are all 9th or 10th. Uh, <clears throat> this will become relevant later. Anyway, the first text in this collection of uh, contemplative and ritual texts describes a series of rites for making and consecrating a painting of Manjushri and then worshipping before it to various ends. And the content is primarily based on the same Manjushri and Mulakalpa uh, Tantra, a uh, different chapter entirely from the prophecy. Uh, anyway, suffice it to say that here is further evidence of the Manjushri Mulakalpa's presence in early Tibet, despite there being no sign of the Tantra itself having been translated. So strange a little bit that they're, that Dharma Tashila is extracting it, other people are writing ritual texts about it, but nobody's translating it. It's a little odd. Around this time when there are these strong restrictions on translating Tantras. Uh, returning to the prophecy, um, the manuscript was first studied by Yoshiro Imaeda in a 1981 article, and as Imaeda observes, Dharma Tashila's rendition of this prophecy works liberally with the original from the Tantra, altering the Tantra's predict own predictions uh, from being about an Indian king identified only as Pa, so you can kind of read yourself into it if you want. Uh, but this one has changed that to foretelling a great Buddhist king named Tsa of the Himalayas to the north. Uh, this very clever transposition, writes Imaeda, was undoubtedly done so that Tibetans could recognize their country at the beginning of this extract. Referencing the old Tibetan chronicle, uh, and a sort of early very early history of Tibet, Imaeda suggests that uh, this Tibetan prophecy was most likely meant to refer to the late 8th century, this Tsa, um, is probably meant to refer to the late 8th century Emperor Trisong, Trisong Detsen, who was responsible for the earlier lexicon of 783. And actually this much is quite convincing. Indeed, in the same year, 1981, oh, I should have shown you that, These are, this is, oh yeah, this is good. Uh, in the same year, Samten Karme lent further support to Imaeda's theory that this is Trisong Detsen when he brought to light Paleo Tibetan 840, um, where another King Tsa is explicitly identified with Trisong, Trisong Detsen here. There's his name, Trisong Detsen. I would, uh, by this root of merit, by making this offering, I would become king. And after placing the earth under a single umbrella of sovereignty, I would pay homage to the blessed Buddha. This is what Ashoka, as a small child, said. In ITJ 380, this resolute wish, or pranidhana, is accompanied by the child generating a mind of awakening, bodhicitta, so it's a kind of Mahayana version, uh, whereby it also functions as the beginning of his career as a bodhisattva en route to full and complete Buddhahood. In its, its wording, the child declares, quote, you see it here, I think, yeah, wherever the Buddha Dharma um, that excellent nectar has become non-existent, there may I be born and raise up the supreme holy dharma." Unquote. The change in wording emphasizes that he will be born in a land where the dharma is absent, like early Tibet. And in Ashoka's legend, the Buddha responds to the young boy's offering by prophesying that he will become a Chakravartan emperor, a Dharma Raja, or king of dharma, king of, of the Buddhist teachings. In ITJ 380, the boy is then uh, born a great Kshatriya, a, great, a lord of the barbarians, Takor uh, Takpo, barbarians being the Tibetans. Uh, Trisong Detsen then was a bodhisattva king and later rebirth of none other than King Ashoka, explaining that, quote, the sinful people of those barbarian lands will not understand 
that the Buddha's profound field of activity is the fruition of mantra, of tantra. So there'll be people in early Tibet where he's reborn as Jesus, and they're not going to understand how important tantra is. So a negative attitude toward it will arise at that time. Fortunately, <clears throat> the king, Trisong Detson, will have spent an e intermediary lifetime after he was the boy, but before he'd become the emperor of Tibet, uh, as a friend to mantradharas, as, as to tantric practitioners, achieving fearless regarding mantra and tantra. He's not one of these wimps who's scared of tantra like are going to be there in Tibet. Uh, indeed, it will be directly due to his previous tantric propitiations and accomplishments, Sevan Sadhana, of the great goddess Tara, that he will be able to defeat those barbarians, quote, all the way to the Tsangbo River and the Himalayas to the north, end quote. Later, the prophecy continues, following the great emperor's rule over this region, he'll pass away, so after Chisong Ditsen dies, he'll pass away, following an, and following an extensive stay in the heavens, will incarnate again, now as a great tantrika, a supreme king of all the mantradharas. And then after that, he'll take still further rebirths until at last he'll be exhorted by Tara herself, this goddess, to return to the god realms as Devendra, the king of gods, to... Uh, teach the good dharma to the gods before attaining final Buddhahood. So, in interpreting this story, my reading here departs from Imaeda's because Imaeda takes the two verses about this intermediary lifetime here uh, uh, as referring not to the future, it's a little bit obscure here, I'm sorry, but uh, Imaeda thinks that this refers to not the previous lifetime of Chisong Detsen himself, but to a different person, a mantradhara tantric practitioner whom the king will befriend. And according to Imaeda then, in a previous lifetime, Trisong Desen was a friend to a specific mantradhara, not just a friend to, mantra, a friend to tantric Buddhism, but he had a friend who was a tantric, tantric practitioner. So Imaeda then, this leads him to compare these verses to another famous story about the mantradhara Padmasambhava, a famous figure in the 8th century tantric Buddhism, and Trisong Detsen, uh, along with Shantarakshita monk, co collaborating as brothers in a previous life to build the Bodhna Stupa in Kathmandu. Uh, perhaps Imaeda suggests this early ninth, I hope I'm not losing you here, but perhaps Imaeda suggests the early ninth century prophecy was aware of this story about the founding of Bodhna when in a previous lifetime Trisong Detsen was friends with Padmasambhava. That's what this is talking about. Unfortunately, I find this far-fetched and unnecessarily complex. First of all, the earliest known prototype for the story of these brothers uh, in Kathmandu dates only from three centuries later in Yang Renlima Oser's uh, 12th century biography of Padmasamba, the Zanglingma. But more importantly, for our purposes, Imaeda's reading also misses the whole point here, namely that the Tibetan emperor's political power was rooted not in his past association with Padmasambhava, but more directly in his own earlier practice of tantric Buddhism as a mantradhara. Here, as in the rest of the prophecy, the focus here is on Trisong Detsen and his previous lives, when he was a friend to all mantradharas and deeply involved in tantric practice. The emperor's own tantric involvements, Dharma Tashila is assuring us his, and his readers, uh, were central to the success of the Tibetan Empire. So whatever Ta Dharma Tashila may have expressed in the 814 lexicon in two parts about the public circulation of the tantras, his careful rewrite of this Manjushriya Mulakalpa uh, prophecy uh, suggests he was nonetheless a strong proponent of their practice within the highest reaches of the court. In this sense, this prophecy testifies to a divided approach to these powerful practices within early Tibetan, within the early Tibetan Empire, an approach that emphasized them privately, even while restricting them publicly. So one other interesting, I think, piece of evidence. These have been talked about by other scholars a lot, but these images of Sarvavid or all-seeing Vairochana. Um, that tantric Buddhism was central to the ideology of the Tibetan imperial court has been suggested already by Amy Heller, the art historian, 
and building on Heller's groundbreaking breaking discoveries, Matthew Kapstein. In a series of articles from the early 1990s, Heller identified several Virochana. Virochana is sort of the central Buddha of Tantric Buddhism at this time, the king of Buddhas. Uh, she identified several Virochana images dating from the imperial period that are scattered across eastern Tibet. Two in particular from Demadrak, this one, uh, near modern-day modern Chamdo, and from Anshi Yulin Cave 25, which is right near Tun Huang. I think it was quite a beautiful image on a wall, an eastern wall. Um, these two images uh, share a common iconography. And then to these, Capstein comes along and adds one more image from the uh, Dunhuang Mogao Cave 14. Uh, he's got it here on the right. Um, with the simil again, the same iconography. And he concludes that the cult of <clears throat> Virochana was widely promulgated with imperial support and that it expressed a significant homology obtaining between, on the one hand, emperor and empire, and on the other hand, Virochana and his mandala, or realm. A few additional observations are, uh, I, I want to add here. First, <clears throat> there are uh, four rock inscriptions that Nathan has studied, uh, and the fourth of them um, uh, is what I'm interested in. They accompany this image from Demodrach. And uh, I'm partly submitting this for your uh, <laughs> comments, um, because the language I find quite difficult to read. I don't know if there's an error or what. But anyway, here it is. And my, well, this isn't my translation. This is Amy Heller's sort of rough translation. When one makes offerings, it's also her transcription. So I have yet to talk to someone who's, she's taking it from someone else. It's third hand. I would like to see this. Um, when one makes offerings and pays homage to the Kula and the Nyempo, uh, La Nyempo, uh, all wishes will be realized and he or she will be born as a god in the next life. So again, I wish I could see this inscription in person because there do seem maybe some transcription errors here like the Tang Tang, Ma Nyempo, I don't know, I don't quite get what's going on there. Um, uh, and I'd welcome any suggestions. Uh, in any case, it might be, it seems to be the case that this kula refers to the image of Virochana beneath which it's inscribed. And if so, this would mean that this image of Virochana that Capstein's already said is kind of a homologous to the, to the emperor, is being portrayed as the kula, the essential life force, the spirit of the emperor as Nathan Hill has written, uh, the Kula is the spiritual counterpart of the Tibetan emperor. He's speaking more generally, not just about this inscription. And has been his companion ever since both resided in the heavens, specifically the realm of Mu. Vassals of the Tibetan empire, not the imperial government itself, propitiate the Kula in ritual observance, end quote. And then, regarding this Nyempo, idea, uh, we might further note that a Nyempo Sangwa, a secret Nyempo, a Nyempo is like a kind of a spirit thing, demon, god, spirit thing. Um, and so a secret Nyempo, uh, uh, according to Sorensen and Hazard, um, following the King Latatori, um, uh, quote, assumed the position of an ancestral spirit, a Nyem, for the imperial clan. If any of this is true, it would be very interesting. So in a way, the Nyempo is just repeating the same idea. If any of this is true, it would be very interesting and lead, lend considerable weight to Capstein's suggestion uh, in an end note that this specific form, uh, that this specific form of Virochana represents the fig, quote, represents the figure that I have begun to think of as the Tibetan imperial Virochana, end quote. In any case, a second, more solid observation on this image may be re made regarding its canonical origin. So Heller and Capstein spend considerable time thinking about the Mahavirochana Sambodhi, 7th century Tantra, 
that does appear in the early imperial period catalogs, but it's quite clear that the Virochin in question here is uh, the central deity of a different tantra, the Sarvadurgati Parishodhana. Um, as Heller and Kapstein mentioned, the mural in uh, Yulin 25 is accompanied by eight figures, four and four on either side. Uh, here's four to the left, and unfortunately you can sort of see how it's damaged on the right. So you can, you can see a bit of one there. Uh, but anyway, there's the four on the left. Um, uh, so Heller and Kapstein have talked about these eight bodhisattvas, but they're not bodhisattvas. These are the famous set of, uh, of eight Ushnisha Buddhas um, that surround Vairochana in the Sarvadurgati Parishodhana Mandala, as described in the Tantra's second chapter. And there we find Shakyamuni at the center, not Vairochana, surrounded by eight Ushnisha Buddhas. Uh, but the Chantra, Tantra's first chapter describes another mandala with Sarvavid Vairochana in exactly this form at its center. Furthermore, among the Dunhuang manuscripts, we see numerous drawings of the Sarvadurgati Parishodhana mandala with Vairochana at the center and the eight um, uh, Ushnisha Buddhas, just like in Anji Yulin 25. So this manuscript um, is uh, an amulet mandala with the Sarvavid all seeing Vairochana in the now familiar form. To zoom in a bit, there he is, just as a pen. And uh, drawing, so not as beautiful, but there it is. Um, uh, and here he's surrounded by eight, the eight Ushnisha Buddhas, um, just as in the mural in A25. Um, the, the whole mandala, to zoom back out again, is uh, surrounded by three additional chunks of text positioned above, here, below, down here, and then the third one winding around. Um, uh, and each of these paragraphs calls upon still further deities to protect an unknown, an unnamed patron, a Yungi Dako. Uh, repeatedly, each of these prayers refers to the patron, who is presumably also the owner of this piece of paper, the mandala, for the manuscript as a whole, almost certainly served as an amulet, as I mentioned. This is indicated by the fold lines that, um, that uh, suggests the whole page was once folded into a smaller square and carried around. Uh, as you can see, the points of deterioration up here where the corners of the folded amulet would have been. If you can zoom in and see, you can sort of see the lines here, the first folds crossing. Um, uh, so this then was a ritually active document. The central significance of this Sarvadurgati mandala and it's all seeing by Rochana is made also by this Seitegi Logyu, which is appended to this very famous early history of the imperial period um, in the Wajing, the Testament of Wa. Um, <coughs> and at least in the received version may date from the 11th or 12th centuries. Uh, following a big fight, it tells the story of a big fight within the court between the Bun, the pre-Buddhist Bun priests um, of, the, of the court and these newly arrived Buddhists over who, who and how to perform the uh, funerary rites for Trisong Detsen. And we read, quote, thenceforth, the Buddhists win, uh, thenceforth funerals were performed on the basis of the mandala of the all-seeing Vairochana and the nine deity mandala, the central one and the eight Ushnisha Buddhas, as it appears in the Sarvadurgati Parishodhana, end quote. So according to this Waje then, this very same mandala was central to the Buddhist funerary practices that replaced the pre-Buddhist Bun rites uh, of the imperial court. Um, and just to note a couple of other important reference, uh, references to how important this mandala and this deity were in, in the imperial period. Later histories describe the layout of Samye Monastery, the first monastery of Tibet, and the top floor, which supposedly centered around an image of all seen by Rochana. And then we can also add that Karchung, this is a 12th century manuscript found 10 or 20 years ago in Western Tibet. Uh, Maha Yoga and Transgressive Tantra. J380's prophecies drawn from the Manjushri Mulukalpa to this all-seeing Vairochana and its Sarvadurgati Mandala. We've seen how Tantric Buddhism was deployed to remake and glorify the identity of the emperor and his court. 
All this despite the prohibitions and controls voiced in the official proclamations in the lexicon in two parts. Notably missing from all this, however, are, is any mention of the more transgressive aspects of tantric practice for which the tantras are so infamous. Uh, most obviously the rights of sexual union and violent liberation. In fact, both the Manjushri of Mulakalpa and the Sarvadurga de Parishodhana, these two tantras we've been talking about that are central to the empire, they actually belong to the tantric classes of yoga tantra and below. So without getting too into technicalities, these lower classes. And the transgressive practices are far more typical of the Maha Yoga, the great yoga tantras uh, class, class of tantras that represented the cutting edge of Buddhist ritual development in India around the turn of the ninth century when we're, talk, when we're looking here. So there is some evidence that the imperial court did draw a strong distinction between the classes of yoga and Maha Yoga. Um, uh, this famous catalog of Tibetan Buddhist texts that were held at Hong Tong around 842 ends with the, the line, the list of translations of inner mantra will be recorded elsewhere. And given that this line immediately follows a list of Kriya Ubayan yoga tantras, all these lower kinds of tantras, um, we can safely assume that what's meant here by inner mantra is Mahayo, the Maha Yoga class. Um, and for what it's worth, I'm not going to get into it. Maybe mention it in the Q&A. Uh, so despite the absence of any Mahayoga writings from the official records, we know they did exist. At least two Mahayoga works may even have been composed by the great Padmasambhava who visited uh, central Tibet around the 770s and composed while he was in Tibet. So for example, this Mengak Tawe Trangwa, the pith instructional uh, garland of views is attributed to him and uh, constitutes a kind of commentary to the opening verses of the 13th chapter of the Guya Garba, a famous Mahayoga Tantra of the mid 8th century. And this attribution to Padmasambhava is based primarily on, uh, I don't want to bore you too much, but it's cited in the Samten Migdran, an early 10th century work as, as Padmasambhava's work. And there's a sub commentary in the 11th century by Rongzong Chugisampo, where he states it was by Padmasambhava. And then, a second work by Padmasambhava is this extensive commentary to the Lasso of Means, Tapkishapa, another Mahayoga Tantra of the mid to late 8th century. Padmasambhava's commentary is titled The Lotus Garland Synopsis, Pema Trangi Dundu. Uh, it may be found in today's Tibetan canons and a copy found in Dunhuang, uh, IOL tip J321, which preserves some unique and lovely co and copious interlinear notes. The work is attributed, this commentary to the Tantra, is attributed to Padmasambhava three times in these notes. So you can see like this small writing here, there's some small writing up here. This is the kind of thing, it runs, it's 100 pages, it runs all through this these notes. And it's in these notes they say this, this is by Padmasambhava. In fact, this last note, which is the la closes the last page, um, is a little sort of poem of praise to Padmasambhava. And a note to the poem right there says, uh, um, Acharya Shantigarbha, some monk uh, who was there in Tibet at the time, examined this work and having found it to be without error, errors, praised Padmasambhava with this four-line verse. So notes like this, uh, which reference the composition of the commentary itself, are why I suspect Padmasambhava may have composed it in Tibet while visiting Trisong Detsen, and, and uh, so very much under, with the permission of the empire. Another Mahayoga text worth considering is the early Tibetan translation of the influential Guya Samaja Tantra, um, which is preserved in the Nyingma Kyubum today, uh, the, uh, and this Dunhuang manuscript. And here again, uh, the composition is accompanied by copious interlinear notes that no one has yet studied. They're all over the place in between the lines here. Uh, they sort of com constitute an entire commentary. Um, that needs to be studied. 
Anyway, as, a, as Ken Eastman has observed, one note in particular, one of these interlinear notes, was at some point mistakenly interpolated into the Tantra itself as a, ver as a couple of lines of the Tantra. Um, uh, and then it preserved as such in today's Nyingma Jubum, this Nyingma canon. So that's interesting. And uh, indicates that these interlinear notes are therefore not unique just to this Dunhuang manuscript, but appear to have circulated widely throughout early Tibet alongside the Tantra. And somebody made the mistake of including it in a version that ended up being preserved all the way to today in the, in the canon. Anyway. The particular version of the Guya Samaja that was translated here includes 17 chapters. This was standard in the second half of the 8th century. Around the turn of the 9th century, however, an 18th chapter, an Uttara Tantra, was added by the great Indian master Buddhanyanapada and his circle. No mention of this final 18th chapter appears in our Dunhuang Tantra, nor anywhere in Dunhuang, nor do any of Buddhanyanapada's revolutionary interventions in Tantric ritual appear. Indeed, as I've discussed elsewhere, the Mahayoga materials that circulated in early Tibet almost invariably reflect the state of Tantric Buddhism as it existed in the second half of the 8th century in India. None of the texts and ritual innovations that emerged in the early 9th century in India, and there were many, appear anywhere. No mention of the this is technical the third and fourth initiations, no mention of Chakrasambhara Tantra or other later Tantras, and so on. Beyond the larger translated tantras and commentaries already discussed here, the Mengak Dawi Trengwa, the Skuya Samaja, and so on, there are a number of translated Mahayoga ritual texts about sex and violence and so on, sadhanas and vidis translated from Sanskrit and preserved at Dunhuang that were probably collected and translated around the late 8th century during Trisong Detsen's rule and the first of the two lexicons. But again, they all reflect this time, the this, this state of Tantra prior to the 9th century. So elsewhere, I've wondered in print why this is the case. And it's only in writing this paper that it started to, I started to have a new idea, which is hypothetical. But um, it makes sense that the imperial translation of Tantric texts was interrupted around 842 when the empire collapsed and they stopped funding the translation effort. But the interruption to the translation of tantric texts in Tibet seems to have occurred several decades earlier. And, in, and I've suggested various times that this discrepancy, why it ends at 800 instead of 842, uh, that maybe this discrepancy might simply be a reflection of the fact that the latest tantric developments and writings in India took some time to gain a wide circulation in India and then make their way up to Tibet and so you know, yes, they stopped translating in 842, but uh, you know, there, there were texts they hadn't gotten yet from the early 9th century. But this is, it could be, this isn't a right suggestion, but, um, but in the case of Buddhanyanapada, who I mentioned, who had, had all these amazing new ideas and didn't, but didn't make it to early Tibet, uh, nonetheless, we do have one of his non-tantric texts, a long Prajnaparamita commentary, that um, may have slightly predated his tantric ones, and that does appear in the imperial catalog. So his writings, his non-tantric writings, are making it there and being translated and preserved in catalogs. His tantric writings aren't appearing. So what I'm warming up to say here is maybe the increasing limits on the collection and translation of tantric works in the early 9th century, as seen in the, in the lexicon in two parts, is reflected in the kinds of Mahayoga texts available in early Tibet, and therefore too, Dunhuang. Uh, perhaps the freer treatment of Mahayoga writings under Trisong Detsen in the late 8th century, where the first lexicon, when Padmasambha was there writing texts and they were translating the Guya Samaja, allowed for compos the composition and translation of, of all these outrageous uh, transgressive texts like Padmasambhava's commentaries, the Guya Samaja, all these ritual manuals, and perhaps such translation efforts more or less ceased in the ninth century during the reign of Tri De Songtsen, the, the next major ruler. Uh, so while somewhat speculative, such a hypothesis certainly is reflected in the kinds of texts we have at our disposal. So at this point, before ending my talk, I just want to mention the writings of one early 9th century Tibetan author, Nyen Pelyong. 
Uh, his writings were the subject of a 2009 PhD thesis by Kam Kami Takahashi. And she dates his surprisingly rich corpus of Mahayoga tantric writings to the early 9th century. So this might be, this might contradict everything I said. Here's a Tibetan writing in the 9th century, writing about Mahayoga. Several of his compositions are preserved in today's canon, the Tengyur. Uh, but one, this question and answers of Vajrasattva, um, is preserved in several copies at, at Dunhuang. And interestingly, a colophonic note appended to the Dunhuang, this Dunhuang version reads, no, that's not it. Oh, it's down here, I didn't translate it. But anyway, I'll read you the translation. Uh, regarding this work's purpose, it was taught for Nanam Dongkyu. And I'm still, Nanam was a very important aristocratic clan Dong was Q, is it? I don't quite know what is a place name for these two people. Anyway, these aristocratic uh, clans or clan. And for the minds of future generations of yogins, with the aim of clarifying any unclear, doubtful, or difficult points. So this is a Mahayoga text written to clarify the questions of the aristocratic clans in the early ninth century. We get a picture not only of the imperial court, but a small circle of closely affiliated aristocratic people that had access to an interest in Mahayoga practice with elite monks like Nyampelion writing lengthy explanations for them. So again, still, maybe this is contradicting everything I've said. In its opening lines, this text says, <coughs> It was written, quote, for those wishing to understand with awareness the way of the Supreme Mahayoga, end quote. This emphasis on with awareness, I think, is significant. While it is a work of Mahayoga, loosely based on the Guyagarbha Tantra, it takes an extraordinarily effort-free, ultimate truth, sort of everything's empty, nothing matters kind of perspective. What David Germano has termed a Gnostic approach to Tantric practice. The language of ritual is used, but really all one needs to do is rest in a state of awareness, and it'll all take care of itself. So we read, simply appearing as oneself. This is the true Dharmakaya, the, the real Dharmakaya. Realized to be changeless, like the sky, in, in propitiation in these rituals of offering and so on. When no action or actor is perceived, there are neither words nor effort. That is the supreme propitiation. No visualization, no ritual propitiations are needed, only resting effortlessly in the ultimate. Such an approach was remarkable enough to inspire a note to this same passage here, which you can see down at the bottom here, um, which says, this is an explanation of the view of Ati Yoga. So this is, an, this is a new class of text that's kind of developing, otherwise known as Dzogchen, which is much more kind of philosophical and saying, you don't need to do all this ritual, you're already a Buddha, don't worry about it all. So this is unusual enough to see in a Mahayoga text that they're saying, this is, this is Ati Yoga. In another text by Pelion, uh, his Lamp for the Mind, the Tukitrumma, he borrows a large number of passages from Buddha Guhya or Buddha Gupta's Margavyuha, an Indian uh, late 8th century work of the Mahayoga class. However, writes Takahashi, quote, it is interesting that he, Pelion, did not make any mention of the rituals or visualizations outlined in great detail by, by Buddha Guhya, but cited instead passages that addressed the more transcendent philosophical issues of spontaneously arisen primordial wisdom, the purity of appearances, selflessness, and so forth, end quote. The same selective referencing, she, she continues, can be seen in the type of passages he extracts from the Guya Garbha Tantra itself. These passages may provide valuable evidence of Pelion's intention in writing these works to depict and propagate a Mahayoga movement that was more concerned with view, philosophical view, than the details of practice." End quote. So given the strengths and restrictions on Tantric Buddhism of the 814 lexicon in two parts, I would like to end by suggesting that we might see, we might just might see in Pelion's more philosophical approach 
a kind of response, a move away from the more transgressive rites that were typical of the late 8th century translations and had become so objectionable, they've already, it's already happened in the, in, in the words of the later lexicon, uh, toward a more abstract approach that advocated transcending such ritual nice necessities and simply resting in the ultimate state of emptiness. Such writings might have appealed to members of the court and its affiliated aristocratic clans, uh, allowing them to explore the cutting edge of tantric Buddhism without their needing to engage in transgressive rites for which, uh, it, it, for which Mahayoga had become so infamous. In any case, it is clear enough from all we've seen that the relationship between tantric Buddhism and political power was not an uncomplicated one in early Tibet. <laughs>